Okay. Ich habe das Signal, genau, ich, man hört mich. Ähm, herzlich willkommen auch von mir, Eva Behrensen. Ich leite die Kommunikation in der Bildungsstätte Anne Frank und habe heute die Ehre, Ihnen Oma Bartow vorstellen zu dürfen, unseren Keynote-Speaker. Ähm, genau, die meisten werden es wissen. Äh, Oma Barthoff zählt zu den ähm, weltweit führenden Holocaust-Forschern. Er ist äh, Professor für Holocaust and Genocide Studies an der renommierten Brown University im US-Bundesstaat Providence. Er wurde in Israel geboren und hat an der Universität von Tel Aviv und äh, am St. Anthony's College in Oxford studiert. In den 80ern waren Sie, Herr Barthoff, in, ähm, auch in Deutschland, unter anderem in Freiburg. Also Herr Barthoff spricht und versteht ziemlich gut Deutsch. Äh, Oma Barthoff äh, forschte und publizierte zur Wehrmacht ihrer Indoktrination durch die Nationalsozialisten und ihren Verbrechen im Zweiten Weltkrieg. Dann widmete er sich den Zusammenhängen zwischen Hitlers totalem Krieg und dem Holocaust und publizierte dazu unter anderem das Buch Hitlers Army. In den vergangenen Jahren hat sich Oma Barthoff besonders mit der Geschichte Osteuropas beschäftigt und einem Teil von Galizien, der in der heutigen Ukraine liegt. Auf Deutsch erschien 2021 sein preisgekröntes Buch Anatomie eines Genozids vom Leben und Sterben einer Stadt namens Butschatsch. Darin rekonstruierte Oma Bartow, wie das Zusammenleben in der ostgalizischen Stadt Butschatsch, in der jahrhundertelang Polen, Ungarn und Juden einigermaßen friedlich miteinander oder nebeneinander gelebt hatten, also wie diese Form der friedlichen Koexistenz oder Koexistenz während der Okkupation durch Nazi-Deutschland umschlug äh, in genozidale Gewalt. Für dieses Buch wurde Omar Barthoff mit dem National Jewish Book Award ausgezeichnet. Eine aktuelle Publikation liegt seit diesem Sommer auf Englisch vor, Tales from the Borderlands, Making and Unmaking the Galician Past. Es gibt einen sehr spannenden Taz-Talk mit Oma Barthoff, den ich Ihnen allen ans Herz legen möchte, vom Juli, glaube ich, diesen Jahres. Da spricht er vor dem Hintergrund des aktuellen Kriegs in der Ukraine über seine Forschungen, seine Familiengeschichte und die Geschichte und die Gegenwart der Region. 2021 ist noch ein weiteres Buch zu einem anderen Thema erschienen, Israel, Palestine, Lands and People, das aus einem, wenn ich es richtig verstanden habe, studentischen Austauschprogramm äh, zwischen der Brown und der Hebrew äh, University heraus entstanden ist. Und übrigens, Oma Bartos Publikationstätigkeit beschränkt sich nicht allein auf wissenschaftliche Fachliteratur, ich habe ihn gerade noch mal gefragt, er arbeitet tatsächlich an einem Roman oder er ist auch fertig. Er ist für 2023 angekündigt und trägt den Titel The Butterfly and the Eggs. Ähm, Oma Bartow, wir freuen uns wirklich sehr, dass Sie hier sind ähm, und sind gespannt auf Ihren Vortrag mit dem Titel Colonialism, Genocide and the Holocaust between the duty to remember and the urge to forget. Is this working? Can everybody hear? Thank you. So let me start first of all by thanking um, everyone, thanking the Frankfurt University of Applied Sciences, uh, thanking especially Miron Mendel uh, and Davide Torrente and all the participants uh, and the audience uh, in what I'm sure will be a very exciting uh, Conference und ich muss mich äh, entschuldigen, dass ich äh, diesen Vortrag auf Englisch äh, behalten werde. Um, otherwise, I'll stumble on my German. Um, earlier this year, I launched a research project titled Israel, Palestine, a Personal Political History. My goal is to interview Jewish and Palestinian members of the first generation of men and women born in the early years after the establishment of the State of Israel and the expulsion of the bulk of the Palestinian population. I'm especially interested in how this generation, to which I belong, feels connected to the land of its birth. As part of this project, in summer 2022, my German-American research assistant, a brilliant young woman, 
conducted additional interviews with several Germans who had volunteered to work in Israel in the framework of Aktion Sühnezeichen, Friedensdienste, uh, Action Reconciliation Service for Peace. Founded in 1958 by the Synod of the Evangelical Church in Germany, the ASF sends volunteers to countries that suffered under the German occupation and to those where many Holocaust survivors ended up to, um, after the war. We were especially interested in how these German volunteers' time in Israel affected them and what kind of connection they formed with the country. So in speaking today about the relationship between Holocaust remembrance and views uh, of Israel in contemporary Germany, I would like to begin by briefly presenting to you a couple of these interviews. Nikolaus F., born in 1953, spent a year and a half in Israel in 1974-1975. In his words, this is an essential part of my life, no question. And he explains, the background for this is that my grandmother died in Auschwitz as a Jew. That's why Israel has always been an important issue for me. My father was imprisoned at the end of the war. And what characterized both sides, I believe, the victims and the perpetrators, was that they did not speak about what they had experienced. My father also didn't talk about his time in the camp. And that is the culpability of the survivors, which is a big topic in Israel, also for the second and third generation. I, he says, have, ex have personally experienced this, what it is like when one lives in speechlessness. Nikolaus initially enlisted in the Navy, but upon receiving the conscription note order, he refused to go. At first, his appeal was denied. This is 19, um, 1974. At first, his appeal was denied. But then he says, my father wrote a letter to the board saying that he cannot support my refusal because he thinks you have to be able to defend yourself with a gun in your hand based on his biography of being imprisoned, but that he respects my decision. And maybe that contributed to the fact that I was then recognized as a conscientious objector. Nikolaus speaks of his decision as, quote, my first total refusal. I didn't want something, I just wanted something different. And then Israel was what you would call my second coming out. He actually uses the term in English, coming out. The chance to do something completely different, far away. The feeling of just somehow starting anew of finding yourself in you, end of quote. He traces this need to break away to growing up in a damaged family. And he says, I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. I wanted to get out of my parents' house where I never felt good. There was a lot of fighting there. My father's mother was arrested in Wiesbaden in 1943. He was locked up in late 1944 in Munich and taken to Buchenwald. My mother was, let's say, from a German family. He means not Jewish, of course. So things were fraught with conflict. And my father would sometimes rage around the house saying, you're all just Nazis. He clearly never got over the loss of his own mother. And my maternal grandmother was also always attacked by him. So this was a very tense story, and it always revolved around the no longer living grandmother. She had died, but she was still somehow living with us as a ghost. Asked how he conceived of his identity before going to Israel, Nikolaus says, 
I knew I was German, but perhaps I was also in search of that Jewish side of my identity, which I had never lived. My father could have immigrated to Israel, but he didn't. Nikolaus worked in Israel with handicapped children and subsequently studied psychology in Germany and underwent years of psychoanalysis. He says, I overloaded Israel with all this. Obviously, my expectations were far too high, and of course, I was disappointed, because nothing was as I had wanted it to be. I felt attracted to the youth in Israel, the kibbutzniks. I did not belong to the young people there and wanted to belong, to somehow become a Sabra. Let's say it was over-identification. Asked whether he eventually found himself and where he feels at home now, Nikolaus says, eventually, yes. Israel's importance for me has diminished. We went there recently with my granddaughter. It's not like it used to be. It's strange. It's somehow alien. And perhaps, after my psychology studies and my psychoanalysis, in which I also talked a lot about my father and maybe understood what I was missing, I never got that in Israel because no one could give it to me and because I didn't know what I need, that I needed it. When we reconciled, and I took over, he and his father, of course, and I took over his company. So that was resolved. But maybe that was just a detour to get back to my father. By now, says Nikolaus, Israel is for me just another state. The whole story is, of course, part of my story. When I hear Hebrew, I prick my ears. I'll probably go there again at some point, but it's not the place where I think, yes, Leshana Ba'ab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. So it's no longer my place of longing. He says he's mostly concerned now with how do I manage to stop working and retire. But then he adds, but I'm of course concerned as I've been throughout my life with anti-Semitism. Returning to his time in Israel 50 years ago, he says, I still retain strong images. Erev Shabbat, um, Friday evening, in the children's home, there was always falafel for everyone, for me too. My heart ache in the kibbutz, where he fell in love. So yes, I have these images, but it's not like I could say that they are now the most intense. Ulpan, language lessons, Nikolaus still speaks Hebrew quite well. At the end of the interview, Nikolaus shares his grandmother's death notice. I still have it here, he says. The original death certificate from Auschwitz. My grandfather received the letter at home. Died on October 20th, 1940, 8.45 a.m. in Auschwitz, Kazernenstraße. Father Isidor Reis. Mother Fanny Rice. That was just the way it was. Everything very precise. Your wife died as a result of general physical weakness at the local hospital. The body was cremated on October 24th, 1943, in the state crematorium. So very, very German. Everything very, very well documented and totally totally correct, everything done correctly, everything done right, he says. Hans W., born in 1954, was also in Israel in 1974-75, and for a while worked in the same kibbutz as Nikolaus. Subsequently, Hans was employed as a radio correspondent for much of his career, including a long stint in Israel and the occupied territories. He is proficient in Hebrew. Hans notes that originally he chose to go to Israel simply because his girlfriend was going there. As preparation, his group was sent to do maintenance work at the extermination camp of Majdanek in Poland, where he also heard lectures on Nazi policies. 
That's how I got deeper and deeper into this topic, he comments. Before that, he says, I knew about the Holocaust only from school. In part, there was also a family connection, but a very unclear one to me. Because as a policeman, my father was in Poland at the beginning of World War II and was deployed as a guard in the Warsaw Ghetto. I knew this, and I also knew that, of course, various crimes were committed there. And I naturally often wondered whether my father was involved, but I did not pursue this further. I did that only later on. Eventually, Hans discovered that before being injured and sent back to Germany in 1942, his father also served in parts of the Soviet Union occupied by the Wehrmacht, where, as a, where his police battalion participated in numerous cases of murdering Jews. My father was very withdrawn, Hans says, whereas my mother told me that she was very young and had the opportunity to travel abroad and get out of a little town under National Socialism. Otherwise, nothing was said about that time. And in this, my family was absolutely no different from 99% of other families in Germany at the time. It was repressed. I began to ask and intensively research this only much later on, after my father had already died. In fact, Hans immersed himself in his family's Nazi past only following his own retirement. That's just in the last few years. Since then, he says, it has become the theme of my life. In a speech he recently gave on this topic, Hans says, I have to come to terms with the knowledge that I had a loving father. He really was a very loving father, but he probably also had blood on his hands. Speaking about his year and a half of service in Israel, Hans comments, we were never asked by Israelis, what did your parents actually do in the war? When we ourselves raised the issue, they always said, you can't help what your parents did. You bear no guilt. Of course, we were somewhat uneasy and insecure. We knew, after all, that many, many people there were persecuted by our parents, fled from our parents, people who may have saved their own lives with great difficulty and hardship, but may have lost most of their family. Fifty years later, Hans is very critical of Israeli policies. The Israel he got to know in his early 20s, in the immediate aftermath of the Yom Kippur War of 1973, doesn't exist anymore, he says. It is a different country, but the experience of living there left a profound mark on him. For me, he says, Israel plays a crucial role in my life. When I get to know people, when you sit down together and say, what did you do for a living? It always comes up. And there's always a controversy because many people think that they must have an opinion about Israel without having a clue about it. That's something very tedious because Israel is really very complex. The Middle East conflict is very complex. It doesn't easily boil down to black and white, positive and negative. It is very, very difficult. There is no good and bad side. Israel is a very important issue for me. On this question, whether I carry a bit of Israel within myself, I certainly do, absolutely. Ruminating further on this issue, Hans adds, of course, I'm no longer the absolute expert. He's retired. But that's unimportant. What's important is that one has a feeling for the country, for what can become of it, and also the fear, in a certain sense, of what the country can or cannot become. This is still a topic I am working through, just like the issue of my father, working through these stories. It still plays a role because there is still a line from the Holocaust to Israel and to personal stories. 
The German journalist and author, and some of you may have read her, Charlotte Wiedemann, was also born in 1954. Her father, she writes, was a member of the NSDAP, one of eight and a half million. Later, she adds, and I'm quoting, he had to go to the Eastern Front, where he, wa where he was, what he saw, he kept to himself. In a photo from 1939, her mother is seen, as she describes it, between two Wehrmacht soldiers. She is blonde and pretty, a young woman who enjoys life and likes to flirt. She also didn't speak later, adds Wiedemann. Only once, when out of the blue, she made a comment about the physiognomy of Jews. And since she was scolded for that, she left the room without a word, tears in her eyes. In her new book, Den Schmerz and Anderen, the Anderen Begreifen, Understanding the Pain of Others, Wiedemann makes a plea for an empathetic culture of remembrance, arguing for the need to replace the ongoing competition of victimhood with a recognition that the commemoration of suffering should never be a zero-sum game. Echoing themes raised by Michael Rothberg just mentioned earlier in his 2009 study, Multidirectional Memory, Wiedemann visits sites of genocide and other crimes against humanity, presenting her readers with the often forgotten or marginalized fates of the victims of extreme violence. She stresses the undeniable fact that the attention and empathy of the West has often been largely focused on the suffering of its own populations, rather than on that of the rest of the world, not least the victims of colonial policies. Unlike Rothberg, Wiedemann does not engage with the question, to which I will return, of whether the German genocide of the Jews was a continuation and a consequence of prior European genocidal acts. Her perspective is both narrower and in that she focuses primarily on empathy and wider, in that she visits sites and events throughout the world and has much to say about Germany. Rothberg, for his part, is mostly concerned with France, its occupation by Germany, and its bitter war in Algeria. While he makes some references to the American case and opens his book with a discussion of several iconic texts by Hannah Arendt, Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, and W.E.B. Du Bois, most of the rest of his materials are French literary and cinematic products. Concerned with the relationship between the memory of the Holocaust and decolonization, the book has practically nothing to say about Germany, which makes the current debate over its recent German translation somewhat curious. It should be pointed out that while Wiedemann condemns European indifference, denialism, and cynicism vis-a-vis -vis colonial crimes, she does not at all speak against the ongoing German preoccupation with the remembrance of the Holocaust, stressing the difficult struggle over many decades to establish the current politics of memory. Indeed, as she points out, even today, German empathy for the Jewish victims is directed mostly at highly assimilated German Jews as was demonstrated, for instance, in the debate over the Wehrmacht exhibition in the late 1990s. I don't know how many of you remember that. Uh, where the East European Jewish victims associated with foreign-looking Ostjuden appeared as opaque and exotic as colonial subjects. The endless multitudes who lie in unmarked mass graves surrounding hundreds of towns in Eastern Europe including members of my own family in my mother's hometown, are remembered by no one, either locally or in Germany, and receive no commemoration, let alone empathy, 
apart from among survivors and their descendants. At one point in her book, Wiedemann describes her visit to the site of the Treblinka extermination camp. Sitting on the ground, alone with the ashes of close to a million victims, she writes, I once again invoke the question of singularity. The answer must include this place, must include Treblinka. If an empathetic, purely personal answer could be given, I would not hesitate. For me, the Shoah is unique. With this word, my lifelong terror, my inability to be done with it, is removed. But then she adds, but isn't this feeling inextricably linked to the fact that I am German and uneasily close to the generation of perpetrators? As soon as I take back, as I step back from myself and my making, I see something else. As a Tanzanian, a Bosnian, a Cambodian, would I want to call the Holocaust unique? Today, I am more aware than in the past of the problem of a classification that claims totality. And it therefore seems advisable to me that everyone should only give a personal answer to this question. This way, we can also avoid a hierarchization of victims, which is inevitably associated with the attribution of singularity as soon as it appears as a dogma. Some Germans hold on to uniqueness as an expression of special sense of responsibility, but they cannot impose their view on others who do not bear such responsibility. Now, I too was born in 1954, just like Wiedemann. My father, who was born in Palestine 28 years earlier, volunteered in 1943 to the Jewish Brigade of the British Army to fight Germany, and later helped Holocaust survivors get past the British blockade into Palestine. My mother was born in Poland and came to Palestine as a child shortly before the war. Both my parents' families were entirely wiped out. No one who stayed behind survived. I first went to Germany in 1979. At the time, I had no sense of being a fellow white European. I distinctly felt like an Israeli from the Middle East, and somewhat uncomfortably also as a Jew. And that was how I was received in Germany at the time, for better and for worse. For me, Germany was then the land of the perpetrators, and being there took a particular mental and emotional effort. My goal in going there, I said to myself, was to study the language, work in the archives, and research the Nazi past. And it must be admitted that at the time, much of the stench of Nazism still hung in the air. More than people then were willing to concede, and more than people today are willing to remember, whether in the form of anti-Semitism, philo-Semitism, or sheer prejudice, defensiveness, and dislike of outsiders, expressed not only by the older generation, but also by some of my peers. Born and raised in Israel, I had no concept of being white, and only a vague notion of being Jewish. My first encounter with anti-Semitism was at the age of 12 in London, when a gang of boys spat at me and called me a filthy Jew in, in Cockney. I, I could imitate that. <laughs> because I was wearing the uniform of a Jewish school. At that time, I should point out, I was protected from the humiliation such acts entail by having come from Israel, where I'd never heard that phrase before, and by knowing that by returning there, I never would. That was a proto-Zionist 
defensive position for me, derived from having grown up in a majority Jewish state and quite ignorant of how that majority had come into being. But that childhood encounter also taught me something about the nature of prejudice and its potentially devastating effects, whether applied to Jews or to Muslims, to Arabs or to blacks. It taught me especially that having a home and roots both protects one from prejudice and facilitates it. Had I known then, or in 1979, that Césaire had described the Holocaust as a crime against a white man, or that Fanon had pronounced the extermination of the Jews to be nothing more than, quote, a little family quarrels, I would have simply had no clue what they were talking about, nor would have any of my family members murdered in Poland and Ukraine by the Germans and by their own neighbors. But today, things are very different. Nowadays, I am a white man in Germany, also gray. And the Holocaust has become a defining feature of Germany's commemorative culture, an inherent component of its national identity, at least as far as its official pronouncements are concerned. In that sense, people like me are not only white, but also somewhat uncomfortably charged with maintaining, preserving, and protecting this memorial edifice. Having known Germany before the current commemorative culture existed, I am aware of its precarity and wary of what might replace it. But I am just as aware of its problematic role, at least in two obvious respects. First, in the extent to which the memory of the Holocaust can work against greater solidarity and cohesion in an increasingly diverse German society, growing numbers of whose citizens or residents have no connection to, the his to that history and carry the memories of other, often far more recent traumas. Second, in the degree to which a German sacralization of Holocaust memory works in the interests of, and has in part been pushed by, right-wing Israeli governments that wish to insulate themselves from just and urgently needed criticism of their policies of oppression of Palestinians. Just like Wiedemann, but from the opposite side of the looking glass, for me as an individual, and for large numbers of Jews everywhere around the world, the Holocaust was and remains unique, and uniquely traumatic. Or oh, let me uh, repeat that. Remains a unique, and a uniquely traumatic moment in Jewish history. To be sure, no historical event is unique in the sense that it may not be compared or contextualized, since otherwise it would be extracted from history and become part of myth or theology. But all historical events have unique characteristics. Without recognizing such unique traits, history would lose all nuance and meaning, becoming just another indistinct event in a long procession of what one historian has called one damn fact after another. Traumatic events have another characteristic. They may and should be compared to other traumatic events if we are to understand them, and as such, as part of history. But for those directly involved, they also remain unique as part of their personal, collective, and national experience. They inform memory, identity, and the construction of a post-traumatic life. In that particular sense, they cannot be relativized. From this perspective, the Holocaust is unique both to Germans and to Jews. 
Germans had never before carried out such a genocide, although they were certainly engaged in colonial crimes, not least in East and Southwest Africa at the beginning of the previous century. Jews had never before, before undergone such a genocide, although they certainly experienced events of mass killings before, not least the widespread pogroms in 1919 in Ukraine. Telling either Germans or Jews that the Holocaust is not unique is thus both true and false. It is not unique because it is part of a wide matrix of mass crimes, both colonial and not colonial, both modern and pre-modern. Hence, understanding the Holocaust as a unique event requires, among other things, to see it in relationship to previous, as well as subsequent massacres, crimes against humanity, and genocides. But the Holocaust is unique to Germans and Jews, and any attempt to deny that has particular consequences. For Germans, denial of the specificity of the Holocaust as a crime carried out by a German state can lead to relativization and apologetics, as well as obscure its profound impact on subsequent generations of Germans, like the people I cited at the beginning. For Jews, denial of the uniqueness of the Holocaust as a profound crisis in their collective historical experience can lead to normalization of Jewish suffering as just one more event in the long chain produced by what has been called the longest hatred, as well as diminish our recognition of the genocide's transgenerational impact on millions of Jews to this day. Nonetheless, in contemporary Germany, insistence on the uniqueness of the Holocaust seems to increasingly undermine social solidarity and marginalized mi minorities. And in contemporary Israel, insistence on the uniqueness of the Holocaust can give license to policies of discrimination and oppression and serve and serves to shield the country from international justice. Now, let me go into a few more details on the links between colonialism and the Holocaust, the ramifications of Germany's current commemorative practices, and the distinctions between racism and anti-Semitism. The past two decades have seen increasing research on Germany's colonial empire, with a particular emphasis on the 1904 genocide of the Herero and Nama people. German scholarship came late to colonial history, mostly because of its primary focus on imperial and Nazi expansionist policies on the European continent. But more recently, the genocide in Southwest Africa has begun to draw increasing attention as a possible precursor of the Holocaust. Now, here is not the place to debate this issue at length. Problematically, it was colonial empires Britain and France that fought against Nazi Germany, alongside Stalin's murderous regime and a segregated United States. No less problematically, what Arendt called the boomerang effect, whereby colonial violence came back to haunt the Europeans, that choc de retour in Césaire's terminology, appears less convincing when we consider the endless violence perpetrated by Europeans on each other in pre-colonial times, including massacres of Jews during the Crusades and the Cossack uprising of 1648, just as two examples. From this perspective, we can just as easily say that Europe exported its, sav its savagery elsewhere, indeed conquered much of the world precisely thanks to its extraordinary brutality, and then brought it back home again. 
starting already with the conquest of Central and South America. The idea of colonialism infecting Europe can therefore be seen as an attempt to save Europe from its own history of violence, part of which entailed its internal violence against Jews, who were imagined as Europe's perpetual non-Europeans long before imperialism. Specifically, as far as the connection between the genocide in German Southwest Africa and the Holocaust is concerned, suffice it to say that not least because of the 40-year gap between the two events, as well as the major difference in the scope of the killing, it has been difficult to find direct links between the two. Arguably, as I've written elsewhere, the mass killing of World War I appears to have played a far more important role in setting the stage for mass murder in World War II than earlier colonial massacres. This, is, this of course, should not detract from the argument that Hitler set out on a colonial war of expansion, especially under the rubric of the Generalplan Ost, and that he and many others in Germany had in mind other colonial empires as a model. One can also argue that the planned Eastern expansion contained numerous genocidal elements, such as mass starvation, subjugation, and displacement of Slavic populations. That empire never came into being, although millions of people died in the process of trying to establish it. But the relationship of the Generalplan Ost to the so-called final solution of the Jewish question, the one component of Nazi policies that did succeed, is more problematic. To be sure, most of Europe's Jews lived in the East. But Jews living elsewhere in the Nazi empire, in France and the Netherlands, Scandinavia and Italy and Greece, and potentially also in North Africa and Palestine, were similarly targeted. Nor were Jews killed because their lands were to be settled or their property to be robbed, although it certainly was. While Jews were used for slave labor, the main goal of the regime was to murder them wherever they were and whatever they did. Creating a German empire was certainly a precondition to the genocide of the Jews. And the larger the empire was, the more Jews could Germany kill. But these were two separate, albeit related undertakings, however similarly brutal and murderous they were, especially in the East. How then does Germany's colonial and genocidal past relate to contemporary politics of memory and increasingly diverse society in Germany? Unlike such former colonial countries as Britain and France, most of the post-war immigrants and refugees that have come to Germany did not originate in its former colonial holdings. Neither the Turkish guest workers that were recruited during the economic miracle, nor the Syrian refugees that Chancellor Merkel allowed into Germany on a larger scale than any other Western country, had anything to do with Germany's pre-1918 colonial empire, nor, for that matter, with Germany's Drang nach Osten of the early 1940s. Unlike France and Britain, or Portugal and the Netherlands, Germany had no experience with decolonization, save for the numerous Germans who served in France's foreign legion in Indochina and Algeria. This is another reason why Germany has completely different multidirectional memories from those analyzed in Rothberg's study. In fact, post-war Germany's treatment of non-German populations ha had, and still has, more to do with other legacies. First was the legacy of German citizenship, which defined Germans by blood rather than by soil 
and the 1913 citizenship law did have something to do with fears of miscegenation with Africans as well as Jews. In the post-1945 era, the law was intended for ethnic Germans who were left out of the much shrunken borders of the Federal Republic. That meant that the foreign workers who had been invited to Germany to fuel its economy and the families that followed them were denied citizenship for decades. Following reunification, which ran parallel to the establishment of an ever more expansive Holocaust memorial culture in Germany, immigration and citizenship laws were liberalized, and the face of German society was transformed. If we think of this transformation as occurring between the historical site of the mid-1980s and the current debate over German identity, we can see why the successful implementation of a Holocaust memorial culture has collided with the new immigrant population that relates to very different historical traumas, some of them definitely connected to a colonial legacy, though rarely a German one. Will a German coming to terms with the country's marginalized, neglected, often repressed colonial legacy help the integration of immigrant populations? I think it will. Not because of a direct link between the two, but because it will create greater sensitivity in German society to the ills of the past, policies that were directed at non-European populations in the so-called name of progress and civilization, and of course of race and space, leaving behind destruction and devastation. It will, as I think Wiedemann rightly argues, facilitate greater empathy for different cultures, religions, and ethnicities. It will jar the German imagination, which is fixated on a particular view of the genocide of the Jews, whereby the Jews were just like us and should therefore engender our empathy. As I noted, the Holocaust was in fact anything but a family quarrel. Yet the German imaginary prefers to see it that way. Recalling the crimes perpetrated by Germans in Africa will not perhaps explain the Holocaust, but it will remind Germans that empathy should not be limited to those who allegedly look like us. Moreover, such empathy should not come cheap, but also entail a moral and material recognition of responsibility for past wrongs. Such recognition, I believe, will also play a role in rethinking Germany's politics of memory vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust. I have become increasingly convinced, really in the last couple of years, that Germany's current memory regime may be blocking, serving as a screen, or hampering both the coming to terms with other past crimes and with contemporary social issues. It has also set limits to German policies and even critical expressions of opinion about the state of Israel. This does not at all mean that the extraordinary and hard-fought ac accomplishment of German society to recognize its responsibility for the genocide of the Jews should be diminished or undermined. On the contrary, I believe that there is evidence that other persecuted groups that have found refuge in Germany and groups that have felt persecuted in Germany have perceived the case of the Holocaust as relevant to them, but only if the lessons drawn from it are also applied to them. A Palestinian who identifies with Jewish Holocaust victims and expects the German society, which claims to feel empathy for those victims, empathize also with the persecution and suffering of her people should be hailed rather than vilified. The whole point of commemoration, or the whole point of commemorating the Holocaust is not to simply bemoan the past, but also to draw lessons from it for the present. 
That was the logic of the endless exhortations in the immediate aftermath of the war, that such a horror should never be allowed to happen again. The never again slogan has been used and abused by all and sundry. But at its core, it looks to the future, not to the past. That past's future is now, and the commemoration of the Holocaust must adjust to the present, lest it be discarded and relegated to the trash bin of history. It should certainly never be allowed to serve as a license for injustice, for silencing the voices of the oppressed, and for self-righteous indignation by those who use it as a shield for their own misdeeds. Now, this being said, some distinctions do need to be made. In recent years, and I think Meron uh, alluded to that, there has been a drive to speak of racism and anti-Semitism as one and the same thing. Now, it is true that modern anti-Semitism as it emerged in the latter parts of the 19th century, took on an increasingly racist or race scientific demeanor. In a world where all groups were defined as racist, the Jew came to be seen as a member of a racial group. And in the frenzy of racial categorizations, Jews and blacks were assigned their own special hell although the derogatory qualities attributed to them differ dramatically. But even in the case of the Holocaust, as well as that of pre- and post-Holocaust anti-Semitism, which is seeing a renaissance today, thinking of anti-Semitism only in terms of racism is insufficient. For the image of the Jews has a much longer and more entangled Christian Western and frankly also Islamic history, partly theological, partly socioeconomic, but altogether deeply rooted in culture and imagination. It does, of course, reflect the dislike and fear of the other, but it is also a component of collective imaginaries dating back many centuries, which are both intimate and familiar, and at the same time, repugnant, and terrifying. This is also why the Holocaust cannot be seen merely as German policy, but must also be understood as a European project. German policy was driven by an ideological construct of the Jews, however convoluted, inconsistent, and filled with contradictions. But the widespread participation of other European populations in the project of ridding the continent of its Jews was fueled by much deeper fears, urges, and hatreds, which both predated racism in its scientific and populist form and have outlived it. It is precisely for this reason that I find the attribution of anti-Semitism to those who criticize Israeli policies of oppression against Palestinians so abhorrent. This is, as Rothberg has recently written, a weaponization of anti-Semitism, although anti-Semitism is, of course, already the weapon. And let me be clear. I do believe that there are those who want to dismantle the state of Israel entirely, including some members and leaders of the BDS movement. And I vehemently oppose that idea just as I vehemently oppose the racist and apartheid policies exercised by the Israeli regime against the Palestinians. But even those who oppose the existence of Israel as it is today, or those who declare themselves to be anti-Zionist, among them not a few Jews, are not consequently anti-Semitic. The Israeli state has every right to defend its existence, and its critics have every right to protest its policies, indeed, even to assert that it should be dismantled. Applying the label of anti-Semitism to them is, to my mind, as vacuous and counterproductive as saying that Zionism is racism. It is for this reason 
that I find the Bundestag resolution on BDS counterproductive. It hurts open discussion and, in fact, also damages Germany's politics of memory. It makes one tend to agree with Wiedemann's assertion that German identification with Israel has become a mechanism of self-redemption. Moreover, the resolution has put German lawmakers on the side of a cynical Israeli policy of shutting up its critics by accusing them of anti-Semitism. And it empowers those who claim that Germany is being run by elites in Israel and America, with all the veiled innuendos that that statement contains. An open, confident, and diverse Germany can afford to allow its critics to speak openly. It can afford to recognize its past wrongs, not only against Jews, but also in its long-forgotten colonial empire and in contemporary society. It can afford to expand its admirable network of commemoration to include the new members of its citizenry and to respect and honor their own traumas. Precisely in order to fight xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism within its own population, it cannot only rely on commemoration of the Holocaust, but must also open itself up to its new citizens and residents and build a culture of tolerance and empathy, willing to assert its position in the world both as a haven for the persecuted and as an enforcer of human rights beyond its borders. Now, on September 1st, uh, 2022, just a few, a couple of weeks ago, the celebrated, the celebrated Israeli author, translator, editor, and leftist activist, Ilana Hammerman, born in Israel in 1944 to parents who came from Poland, published an article in the Israeli daily Haaretz under the title, I, a Holocaust Denier. She writes, and I'm quoting here, it's my translation. I and members of my generation in Israel, whose grandfathers and grandmothers were murdered, born in Israel to parents who fled from Europe at the last moment, or managed to escape the German perpetrators and their collaborators with great physical and mental torment, we were raised and educated in the shadow of the Holocaust which became our myth. This myth, because it was deprived of all its social and political components, instilled in us great fear and darkness of something that was known to us, <clears throat> known to us only from tales of horror and the simplified figure of six million. Referring to a 1988, a famous 1988 article titled In Praise of Forgetting, by historian and Holocaust survivor Yehuda el Kana, the late el Kana, in which he blamed the brutality of Israeli troops in the First Intifada against Palestinians on compulsive Holocaust education, Hammerman states emphatically, and I'm, I'm quoting this passage, I personally do not forget and do not wish to forget that the Germans murdered millions of Jews in Europe, including my mother's family. That is why the title of Elkanah's article is not relevant to me. But the article points out certain truths, which are all the clearer today. They are so clear that I see myself as a Holocaust denier. I deny the Holocaust over which the state of Israel has taken ownership, and on whose true lessons it has been trampling for decades, each and every day. I deny the Holocaust that the state of Israel manipulates successfully in order to receive support from the rest of the world. How detestable it is that in Germany, this manipulation has succeeded more than anywhere else. There, in the place where the evil originated, any opposition to Israeli policies is considered anti-Semitic. And so, I find myself not only as a Holocaust denier, but also as an anti-Semite. 
end of quote. Now, having long admired Hammermann's remarkable translations from German and French, and more recently she's translating from Arabic as well, and her courageous political activism, all I can say in conclusion is that I wholeheartedly agree. And to Germans, to scholars and students, politicians and intellectuals, I say, take this to heart. You, like us, have a duty to remember and an urge to forget. Remember what happened and do not forget why. Because men and women of conscience, good and law-abiding citizens, stood by and said nothing. In the name of the memory of the past, speak out against the injustices of the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oma Bartov. Um, vielen Dank, Oma Bartov, für diesen sehr dichten Vortrag. Um, we, ich habe eine schlechte Nachricht. Wir haben nur noch so etwas wie drei Minuten, um zu sprechen <lacht> miteinander. Aber ich habe auch eine sehr gute Nachricht, denn Oma Bartov wird spontan gleich in die Runde zum Historikerstreit um, 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 <lacht> aufs Panel kommen. Also insofern um, können wir jetzt ein, zwei Fragen tatsächlich aus dem Publikum noch reinnehmen, gehen dann in eine Kaffeepause und machen dann mit Oma Bartow auch weiter. Genau. Mhm. Genau, da kommt das äh, Saalmikro. Äh, Herr Bartow, Sie haben sozusagen meine Generation beschrieben. Ich bin Jahrgang 41, bin wahrscheinlich eine der Ältesten von hier. Und eine Frage, die meine Generation immer und immer wieder sich stellt und ich will mal sagen, in meiner Blase, nicht? ich weiß nicht, was jeder denkt, das ist die was hätten wir gemacht? Was hätten wir an der Stelle unserer Eltern gemacht? Und ich glaube, dass diese Frage die Erinnerung so überschattet hat, dass sie gewissermaßen erstickt ist in dieser Frage. Yes, I, I, uh, I, I think you put it better than I did. Um, it, it, it's so in a sense, it's, it's a paralyzing sense. Um, the, the one thing I would add, and I'm, I'm a little bit younger than you are, um, but usually these days I find myself the oldest person in the room, um, that um, there, there is a similar mechanism, although as I said from the other side of the looking glass, also among my generation, that is what would we have done. Um, and th that is something that in my own upbringing uh, in Israel uh, focused on um, how we were different from those who went like sheep to the slaughter. That is that we would have resisted. We would have fought with a gun in our hands. And, that, and that's what Elkanah actually referred to in, in that famous article from 1988. That mechanism of thinking what would we have done meant that the conclusions we drew from that was that any danger to us is an existential danger and has to be entirely destroyed. So in that sense, the memory of that past was both paralyzing and empowering, but in that it was, but it was empowering in a way uh, that refuse any distinction between one threat and another that had its own uh, violent potential. Um, and so I, I think that this being stuck in that moment of what would we have done can bring you to one conclusion, which is to exert a great deal of violence against whoever threatens you, or if we think about 
and that's something that I'm interested in at the moment about how Germany is responding to what is happening in Ukraine, can also uh, paralyze you and can say, because we did horrible things in, in the Soviet Union in World War II, then we don't want to do anything now. And therefore, it's, you know, the Russians may be killing a lot of Ukrainians, but we don't want to go there because of the bad things that we did in the past. So, so it can both paralyze and or uh, legitimize, give you a, a carte blanche uh, to act violently. Um, and it's, it's that process of coming to terms with your inability to put yourself in that moment uh, that somehow has to be overcome. Da ist noch eine Frage. Ja. Um, thank you very much. Um, you talked a lot about Germans and Jews, and my question quite simply is, who are these Germans? Is it a question of ethnicity, of family history, of per perpetratorship, of residency, or of citizenship? Because um, I, I saw a certain tension when you said, for Germans, the Holocaust is supposed to be that, and for Jews, that. And then you talked about um, diversity in Germany. Mm -hmm. And so, to put it a little bit differently, for someone who is of Turkish origin, but who ha became a German citizen, do those sentences that you uttered about Germans apply to them as well, that the, German, the Holocaust should be something special to them? Or does it not apply to them because their grandparents were possibly not involved? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly what I was trying to say. That is that Germany, uh, from, especially from the 1980s on, as a society, as a politics, uh, as a culture, had been creating a particular uh, memorial culture of the Holocaust. But at the same time, just while this was happening, and I think it was a very important undertaking, and I saw people were engaged in that, uh, and how difficult it was to do that at the time. At the same time, Germany was gradually becoming more diverse, and so more and more people who are German citizens, who speak German as a first language, have traced themselves back to a completely different background. And so while that memorial culture was being created, as is we as Germans, meaning we Germans whose ancestors were German and who share that history of the Third Reich, ended up um, being exclusionary of those Germans who do not trace themselves back to that history. And so th I think that the attempt is admirable, but German society has meanwhile changed. And so what was supposed to become a, a, a solidarity of memory uh, has a potential to become exactly the opposite. And my own sense is that the way uh, to overcome it is not to dismantle uh, this whole edifice of a memory of the Holocaust, but to include in it also um, the, the, the past, the memories, and often the traumas of those people who became German citizens, who are now German, but who don't trace themselves to that past. So it's to expand it rather than to log on only to that, or to say, okay, we should stop it now, and we should stop talking about the Holocaust because it's, you know, it excludes other people. Um, so, so this is really what I was trying to say, uh, and in that sense, you, to my mind, what has happened in German society is wonderful in the sense that it has become more diverse, but its memory culture hasn't. And so it's that culture that needs to be adapted rather than dismantled. Does that make sense? When you said that the Holocaust is supposed to be something unique for Germans, mm -hmm. so I, th I think I heard this as a normative statement from you, that something that should be the case for Germans, the Holocaust should be unique. And does this mm. sentence also apply for new Germans? Right. Well, it, 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 it doesn't, but I would say, I, I would add one, one thing to that. You know, I, I live in the United States, right? 
and uh, the United States is made of people who came from everywhere, right? Uh, but if you, as an American, uh, be you from Polish origins or Italian origins, Spanish or whatever, uh, you say, okay, it's true, there was slavery in America in the past, but that's got nothing to do with me. I came from Spain. Uh, there, there is a problem with that statement too. That is, if you want to become part of a society and of a culture and of a history, you cannot entirely deny that. You only want to have Beethoven, but not Hitler. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, I think that while German society has to recognize the fact that there are many members of it now who come from completely different countries with completely different histories, those people, if they want to become part of German society, they also have a responsibility toward that history, and not only to themselves. It's, it, it is complicated. It's, it, it's not a simple uh, issue, but um, but there is a responsibility of joining a society, of taking on also its misdemeanors, its guilt, uh, its crimes, and not only the good sides of it, that it has whatever, a good uh, um, uh, healthcare system, right? Danke schön. Ich muss jetzt wirklich die Spielverderberin sein und sie alle in die Kaffeepause schicken. Gott sei Dank können wir ja Dankeschön. gleich diese Themen und die Fragen, die angerissen wurden, auch noch vertiefen. Vielen, vielen Dank, Oma Bartok. Thank you. Thank you. Ja. Should I take it off?